it's time to stop catering to the status quo, thinking that will somehow help us, and instead turn our attention to the least of these, as we we hear referred to by Jesus, those with the least power and the least uh, visibility and least resources, and cater to them, and and move out the people of power that are hurting the people they're supposed to care for. Hello, my name is Clay Boykin, and I am in search of the new compassionate male. I believe in the midst of these incredible times of change, a new compassionate male is emerging as the new archetype. And this podcast is intended to give voice to both men and women on the overarching topic of compassion consciousness in men. Hello world, it's me, Dennis, and today in In Search of the New Compassionate Male, I get to produce this episode along with the founder, Clay Boykin. Hello, Clay, would you introduce our guest, Susan, please? Hi, Dennis, absolutely. Susan Cottrell is with us today. I met Susan in March of 2019 here in Austin, Texas Hmm. at, at the News Story Festival. We actually had booths right next to each other. Susan's got a powerful story, a heartbreaking story, and an inspiring story. And I'd love to pick up wherever Susan would like in that. And gee, we've got so much to talk about. Gosh, gosh, yes. And because this is, Susan, don't you see that this is a time of new stories? Yes, that we're all telling new stories and re re seeing our stories just in the past 20 years when we've seen new stories being told and and new ways of relating it's it's, it's extraordinary it is extraordinary and i look at the past year of a pandemic shutdown i can't imagine anything else that would have shut down the world like it did and it's time to hear the stories that have been incubating and that people haven't had a chance to tell and mm. listen to the stories that have been being told, but haven't, people haven't been listening to. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's a, a, a time of change. We've been in an embryo now for all this time, and I hope we come out listening to the stories that are being told and not just go back to status quo. That would be the the worst outcome I could see. (laughs) Amen. So what's changed for you? What's changing in your story and in the advocacy that you've been doing in in your life, Susan? Well, um, so in Freed Hearts, I have been doing, I had been doing a lot of writing, a lot of traveling, a lot of producing of content. And this last um, time, this last year, I think has been sharp focusing, producing the content that we need to get out there to continue to bring in the stories of people. Um, A man in Germany who just wrote me about his situation with the priest there, pastor they call him, but it's the German Catholic Church Mm -hmm. and the whole response to the Vatican. And how he's saying, you have got to listen to our stories. Like the the Pope was saying, or the this pastor was saying, you know, well, we've got to be uh, understanding of the church's position and and the bind they're in with the Vatican. We're like, no, you have to mm-hmm. understand our position and our families that you've destroyed and our lives that you have crushed. And so, all of that to say, I think it's time to stop catering to the status quo, thinking that will somehow help us, and instead turn our attention to the least of these, as we we hear referred to by Jesus, those with the least power and the least uh, visibility and least resources, and cater to them, and, and move out the people of power that are hurting the people they're supposed to care for. Mm, I love that. Yeah. I, I've got a question. You said you mentioned Freed Hearts. Yes. Now that's a blog, and it's a whole 
um, Kit and Caboodle. It's a whole nonprofit that we have. Okay. And there's several elements. There's a blog. There's um, print content in the form of books. And there's video content with the online courses that we offer. And we have um, lots of YouTube videos as well. And then we have live. I travel and speak um, till this past year. And I will resume again. And we have our podcast that just came out. We just started, I don't know, several months ago, really. Really? And is it called Freed Hearts Podcast? Freed Hearts Podcast, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. And your YouTube videos get a couple of hits, I understand. Like millions of viewers on it, literally. Yes, yes. And my TED Talk, too. And your TED Talk. That's right. That's right. I was seeing that. What is the general topic, the essence? Uh, Can you tell us about that? What what started Freed Hearts? Yeah, so... Our, we were in the evangelical church, the cons- conservative, non-affirming church. We didn't realize they were non-affirming because there was no reason to yet. Um, we were there for 20 years, and then our daughter came out, um, first as bi and then as gender non-binary. And we're like, okay, we know how this is going to go down at the church. We just, we just knew. Nobody had gone through it that we witnessed, but we knew. And right, Susan, hold on. Oh, hold, I want I want to ground this in okay. history, in mm-hmm. her story, <laughs> in their story. So, so w- what year was this? Uh, it was 2010 when Annie first came out. Wow. See, things. Th- this is the whole, people won't unless we know that it was what was 20. 20- like at that time and the atmosphere which is so much different in many ways than in 20 i mean yes certainly there are the underlying uh well, the underlying traps that are still there but there has been some progress in the awareness during that time that that she had to go through that was even harder than 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 the child that is going and family today that's right that's right but I would say that overall, the culture has gotten more affirming, but the, but the extreme, um, the ones who are non-affirming, they wouldn't consider this, themselves extreme at all. But the non-affirming element has, in a lot of ways, dug in their heels. Many have realized, hey, mm-hmm. this is nothing like Christ. This is nothing like what we're supposed to be doing. And they've really come a long way. But many have dug in their heels and politically, many on the far right have dug in their heels. So it's yes, the culture has come a very long way and we become more dichotomized. So it's it's Mm -hmm. really an interesting situation. All right. Now, so so please, uh, please, I I apologize for for stopping there and that thing. But all right. So we're in 2010. We're going out. And the conversation that was happening within your family was. Yeah, well, we, so Annie said, I've, I've resisted it. I've tried not to be, I've prayed about it, but it, it won't go away. And I'm, and I'm resisting claiming it. I don't want to say I'm bisexual because then I really will be like, then it's a done deal, you know? And so I was helping her resist. I was saying, well, let me, how can I help you? Do we need to get a counselor, whatever? And I didn't know what I didn't know. And I, I wish I had known more then, but it, it was it was really just a few months that um, kind of all that just fell apart. She said, I've done all those things. Hmm. And she moved away. She finished college, moved away. Very conservative Christian college, which was the one she chose. But it's... it's <laughs> you know, Irony much? Yeah. And, and it, she chose it given the place from which we raised her, you know? Certainly. Um, yeah. So, but anyway, she moved to New York and she called me some months later and said, I'm dating women now and I'm more at peace with God than I've ever been. Oh. And that to me was all I needed. Oh. That was it. Like, if you're at peace with God, I am at peace with God. And so, um, you know, we, we just started moving forward from there, but I, and I started researching everything I could. And I remember reading, reading materials and finally just 
pushing it all aside and saying, there is no love in this. There's no love in this. And I told some friends at church, as women do, you know, we talked to each other and I said, I, my daughter's come out, blah, blah, blah. She's bisexual. And they, and they said, individual coffees, you know, um, they said, this is a sin and you can't accept it, which was just mind blowing to me. No, it's the daughter that I fed mashed bananas as a baby. It's the daughter I, I taught to read. It's the daughter I would give my very life for. It's not a sin. You can't boil this down to a sin that I can't accept. What would it mean not to accept her? You want me to fracture my family over a theology? No, I'm not doing that. Mm. I don't see that in Jesus. I don't see that. Where? Never. Mm. Never. Never. Uh, there is no place in any of the writings, any of the writings, any of the teachings, any of the place where that would be. Yeah, absolutely. Abs except in the religious leaders whom he's ripped apart. <laughs> he ripped them apart. And so, okay. Okay. If that's your model, it's not a good model. So um, I continue to grow. I looked for, I looked for material. I looked for groups I didn't really find them, so I, so I created them. Um, we we uh, connected with a couple of other moms who founded a moms group online that we that is thriving and going strong. Lots and lots, thousands of moms in there. Um, so we just kept kept growing, and we have an LGBT group too for people to who are just trying to get their feet, you know. Mm -hmm. But as I really tore into the theology of it, I was like, this doesn't hold water at all. None of this holds water. These verses that are supposed slam dunks against this community are not. And mm -hmm. so it all broadened out. When that box opened on LGBTQ, other boxes opened on racism, on um, you know genocide of people groups that we, we don't think are Christian. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. in this country um women all of the things that has been done in the name of christianity that have been decimating yep so that's that was an amazing journey that i did not expect and the door opened for me to go to seminary right at that time too so i went to seminary i was like holy smokes <laughs> <laughs> How in the world did you survive <laughs> seminary? <laughs> well, it, was a, it was a progressive seminary. Okay. So, welcome. Mm -hmm. And I said in the in, entrance interview, I said, I am affirming of LGBTQ. I want to be very clear about that. They were like, great, no problem. <laughs> so, but I was, it was going to be a deal breaker if that, if I could. Of course. Be. Yeah. Yeah. God, how wonderful, Susan. It's it, so wonderful. And the, and the conservative seminaries, they kind of lie to you. They, they just teach you how to finesse scripture in a way to maintain the hierarchy. That's really mm -hmm. what happens. Mm -hmm. And in, in my progressive seminary, it was about deconstructing the hierarchy. That's night and day. Yeah. And, you know, when, when Clay and I, we're talking with a lot of men and we're talking about the, the woundedness of being wounded by the patriarchy and the patriarchy that is being served by both men and women for whatever different reasons that there are to preserve this. Yeah. So we're, we're looking for men and working for, with, with, with men who, who are, I say we're working with Clay, Clay is working with men. I, I get to be with Clay uh, in, in this process of finding the compassion uh, within ourselves, being able to communicate with head and heart so that the people, you said that the moms, the moms at the churches were, were, were getting get the men, were you, what were you finding the echoes within the male community or the men that identified as, uh, the people that identified as men in the in the christian communities you know there is so much pressure on men in those groups to maintain the status quo mm -hmm. they i just i just read an article in the new yorker just came through and i was trying to remember the man's name i'm not sure but you can easily find it um where he talked about toxic masculinity yeah. and the cost to men he talked about his own father who was, you know, beer drinking, staying in the garage, 
you know, with racist, homophobic, sexist mm-hmm. jokes and all of that. Conversation talking about, oh, I'd rape her if I could, you know, and just horrible, mm. horrible things. And that was the community that he grew up in. And you, you know, he he was estranged from his father. He got away as far as he could for as long as he could. But finally, years later, connected with him, and his father said, "You know, I the pressure to be a that kind of man is just it's overwhelming. I didn't really have a choice. I didn't think." And his son was appalled by that. He had no idea that his father was going along with that um, patriarchy. But it's so oppressive from the beginning. You know, if a girl falls, trips, we say, oh, come here, honey. And a boy trips, we're like, shake it off. And, you know, it starts from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, what I've been learning over this past several years, and of course, this year with the podcast, which is a year old now, okay. my my sense is that these generation right now, the the young men that are growing up, the people of our age even, are doing our best to stop that cycle. You know, I can look back at my father, and in so many ways through life, whether I was before I was conscious of it yeah i'm not going to be that way and i hear this this drumbeat of here and no further jerry a couple days ago jerry tao was talking about that within the hispanic community that he grew up in and uh, was part of the process Yeah. yeah and the desire to break the cycle so the consciousness of breaking the cycle uh sure seems to be out there yeah it's not overnight but no Is it, so. do you so. think do you think susan you know in in now let, we're going to talk i'm going to talk broad generalities here but do you think when we cut when, when we dig down to this place where the knot is so tight where it's so hard is it going to take that generation to die off mm-hmm. or is there is there a way? I mean, we're trying to look at this geologically, you know, and also humanity, how long we've been around, because this is a tight knot. This is a holding on for dear life to the last vestiges of white supremacy, of white male patriarch, of what we're, this is a, this is holding on for all it's worth. Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, that's a million dollar question, I guess. I mean, Back in the back in the sixties, remember the age of Aquarius and all. Seventy three. I'm the elder in on this on this on this podcast, so so maybe I remember. <laughs> you know, and they were really. It, it's the dawning of the age of Aquarius. We have a whole new world opening up, and I believe that's been happening. That was fifty years ago. Yeah, I know. Um. And so I think we've been in the throes of these birth pangs, as as you call mm-hmm. them, um, yes. for some time now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you see some of the very conservative people that are just doubling down. So I, I think it'd be okay if we waited for that not to die off, but they have children and, you know, children's children who have been raised up in it too. So it's a... Uh, to find value in the patriarchy, that there is some value in maintaining that little bit because they cannot see that their synergy is the only way forward. That yeah. one plus one has to be greater than two. It's not a zero sum game. And not just benefit from the patriarchy, which there certainly is, but exorbitant cost not to comply. If you just don't have a favorite sports team, you get beaten up and shoved in your locker. I mean, you know, it's, it's, so it's, it, they get you in that patriarchy. I'm talking to two men here mm-hmm. and all these others. Thank you. Thank but, you. You know, they get you in there one way or the other and by enticing you or bullying you or both. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really hard women. Um, we're oppressed in other ways, but we don't have that pressure that men have to man up. 
like that. Mm-hmm. I think that's a horrible burden. You know, I've I've had the privilege to work with an organization called Gender Equity and Reconciliation International. They're now 29 years. They worked with Desmond Tutu. They've been to the Vatican. Uh, they've done work with the United Nations. I had the opportunity to support some of that work. And the... The essence of where they begin is the recognition that both men and women are wounded. Yes. And yeah. that as we see that with one another and we begin to hear that firsthand, not comparing wounds, right. but recognizing that we're wounded. You know, I stood up in one of our you know sessions when we were talking about woundedness and I said, I'm the privileged white western male i've got everything going for me and i do i'm privileged but let me share a little bit about my wound right for educational purposes not to woe is me but just to say look i'm i'm wounded too and afterwards it happened two or three women separately Mm -hmm. said gosh i never thought about it like that yes and vice versa yes for me to sit there and to listen to a woman for the first time in her life express what had happened to her. Yes. Not only with women expressing it, but in a mixed group and, and to go through it, there's an alchemy that, that takes place where we begin to see each other. And it will come through story. I do believe what you're just saying. Yeah. Mm. Our story. Yes. We have to convey our stories to each other. We have to listen to our stories. And probably that's my biggest gripe about the religious element and the right, you know, the conservative element. I don't want to say the wrong words here, but they they don't really listen to your story. If your story doesn't fit what they already believe, they just discount it. Well, then how are you ever going to learn and grow? How how is that in any way humility? And can you convince them that that belief is fear-based? Yeah. yeah. Can, can you step outside of yourself, Susan, and say that <clears throat> your daughter didn't come out and she, you know, identified as heterosexual and and all your children were completely down, right down the line, right within the spectrum and that how would you have opened your heart? That's a great question. I mean, mm. that, that's the thing that did open my heart. So it's very hard to see. I hope to God that I would have. I hope to God that I would yeah. not mm-hmm. continue down this path. And I think if, if the last four years didn't send a wake-up call, then mm. there is no wake-up to be done. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope that I would have observed and said, you know, Something's rotten here. This is not working. Yeah. Uh, but I'm amazed at the number of people who just keep hobbling along. So I honestly don't know. I, I all, you always think I would have protected the Germans in, in Nazi Germany. I mean, the Jews in Nazi Germany. Well, yeah. But would you have? I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly. Uh, the, the feeling I had, I remember I, I have this... Um, this image of myself that I would, uh, in a, in a sense of, of my wife and best friend that I would protect her is an instinct. And we, we were on an escalator. We were on an escalator in an airport and a bang happened. I was something fell over whatever, but it was a bang. And my first instinct, I moved the other way and I went crap. Here I thought all this time I had this story in my head that and what was the first thing I did my what and <laughs> well and and one of the things and sorry I don't mean to do any bashing here but, I, but <laughs> bash away but help us <laughs> we're, we're we're in this together part of the culture but one of the things that's drummed into men Mm -hmm. um, in this way is that you better be able to fix it. And if you can't, you got to run. It's essentially fight or flight. 
and we noticed that, oh. that that's what you did. You thought, here's something overwhelming, I'm out of here. And it was instinctual. <laughs> and we noticed that we worked with kids with cancer for 10 years, my husband and I. And in all the families, in every single family, the mother was there. Yeah. But in a lot of the families, as soon as the diagnosis came, the dad was gone. Now, it didn't help the family for him to leave at all, but he couldn't take it. He would fight. I can't fight this cancer. I can't change it. Okay, I'm out of here. And it's flight. And so they're steeped in fear. That was my con um, mm -hmm. conclusion on all of this that. This is our learnings. Clay, you, yeah. you get that. Absolutely. Absolutely. The and women are not. Mm -hmm. women, are, women are trained in a dance. They have to dance with the men in their lives to get anything done. They have to dance with with all the rules they didn't set up and black people the same way, mm -hmm. people of color, you have to dance with the rules that you, you never made up, <laughs> never agreed to you to born into them. What is it? Uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Yeah. yeah. What great dancers they were, except she did it backwards and in the high heels. Yeah. yeah. But Clay, you know, this is what in in our work, Susan, and 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 the, the work that Clay is doing, and the work that Clay is teaching me, being beside him as we're working together, is that when we work on compassion as an active principle in our lives, we can begin to heal that and begin to be part of not to, so that when that happens, because that's that that fight or flight. That, that place is that, that there is a, a wound or a blockage. How would you phrase it, Clay, uh, that, that, that prevents us from being able to get, but, the, but compassion has, a, has a, a softening effect. Well, let me try this. Please. What I'm learning along the way in my work with the organization, Karen Armstrong's organization, Charter for Compassion. You mentioned that. That's good. Yeah, yeah. And what I've learned through their uh, compassion integrity training that they provide is that compassion is part of our DNA. It's innate. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be nurtured. Yes. And what I'm uh -huh. choosing... Yeah, it's got to be nurtured. And what I'm choosing to believe is that all this pressure that's happening right now, the, the, the last four years, the pandemic, everything, that that spark of compassion within men, it, there's a burning there. Yes. And I think they're beginning to realize that that's not a negative thing, that that's the divine energy. That's the spark of light. And that and rather than spend all the energy pushing it down, embrace it and integrate it and move forward yes. and grow. And that's the divine masculine, the divine feminine, however you want to call it, the solar yes. lunar, you know, it, it, that integration, it's not move from the head to the heart. We've heard that so many times and guys say, what, leave my head behind? Right. No, 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 no. This is an integration. Yes, yes. And to the point of it, the you know, Howard Teich made this point. He was talking about the, the solar masculine, the solar feminine, the lunar masculine or the male and the lunar female. And he said to us, the lunar leads and the solar executes. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, the execute, we're, we're you know, us guys, generality, cut. we're yeah. cut off at the neck, you know, we're working in our head. So it's, it's, you know, <laughs> lead, you know, <laughs> fix it, fix it. <laughs> and I didn't, when he first said it, I didn't go for that at, at first, but then I went back to my Marine Corps days and said, absolutely. Leadership is from the heart. We have to integrate that or we're not a complete person. We're not a complete male. We're not a complete leader right. That's without right. the integration of head and heart. Yeah. And it's been said so many times throughout history, isn't it? Hasn't it? But we mm -hmm. kind of don't really hear it. I, I love what you said. You're kind of softening me to <laughs> more to the plight that men are in that they that they didn't choose, that they didn't sign up for. That's just the rules they were given. Yeah. 
Well, and and I want to I want to build on what you're saying there. Now, I'm going to make another generality. In general, it's my belief that when a a young girl is growing up, that she has a different relationship with her mother Mm -hmm. than Mm -hmm. the young boy with his father. Mm -hmm. That there is a dialogue that happens between mother and daughter where she's learning to speak from head and heart. And there's this practice time yes. that didn't happen with daddy and me. Daddy loved me, but there wasn't that connection. There wasn't this struggle to speak and to understand. And so what we're doing in our circles and our men's circles in a place where there's no judgment, yeah. no one's calling anybody out is we're practicing. Yeah practicing connecting the heart to the mouth right. and learning that language. And as we're learning it, we're then now beginning to be able to integrate it. Yeah. That's a long, slow process. And, and, and we found Susan, you, you know, over our, our, over our lives anyway, we found that in general, women are more emotionally intelligent than men. Mm-hmm. That's the, and just as a as a generality mm-hmm. that if you were to put them on a scale, but that's a learned thing. Yes. It's something that we can. Grow. This gives us an opportunity to say, how do we grow our emotional intelligence so that we can meet men and women and people on the entire spectrum? Yes. At a at a higher level, but that's our work to do. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's our work that we have to be willing to say, how do I grow myself emotionally? How do I, all right, if I want to grow myself intellectually, I can go and do brain games and I can go and do, do yeah. the work. Well, Clay, you've been seeing it through the Charter through, uh, for Compassion and Gender Equity of the ways that we can grow ourselves emotionally. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so well put. You know, I kind of jokingly say, but there's a serious vein of truth in it. On what Dennis was saying that, yes, women tend to be more emotionally intelligent. Sure. And us guys are got some ketchup. And the women aren't going to come down here to meet us on our mm-hmm. level. So we, and that's work. That's work that men have got to do with men yes and it's possible and there's you know men's organizations that work to break into the guy to get him into his heart yeah there's the approach that i'm taking with our men's circle that there's a whole population of men that are in their heart already yes and they're stuck yes and so we work from the inside out to help them i'm sorry how are they stuck? Oh, gosh. Well, one example. Um, they've gone through dark night of the soul. They've been in the ditch. They've gone through their recovery press program, and they're looking for something a little bit more positive, not to leave their recovery program because it served a purpose. They're looking for something a bit more positive, maybe more spiritual, but they equate spirituality with religion and they got burned on organized religion. So they're not going to go back there and they can speak really pretty deep with their partner or their spouse, but there's still another piece there that they can't go into. So they've got to go speak with another man. Yes. However, we're trained not to trust each other. And so we're stuck and we are festering and we are literally dying and or we're killing somebody else yes. Yes. because we can't get that figure that out yes. and in some ways i'm defining myself yeah. so it's very lonely for me it, it is it's very lonely it's a very long i rem- yeah. susan i remember when i was growing up feeling i would look at other men and i would hear that and i would hear the way men masculinity was described and i would go oh my god i am the one screwed up person i am the i I am not like what i'm seeing out there as described as that's mighty much a man Right. And I'm going, that's not me. And I'm going, what is the matter with, and there was no model. But given the opportunity, 
And I stumbled on it because, you know, this is what I needed. I figured if, if I needed to figure out how to trust another man to learn from other men, that there's other guys out there. And sure enough, and <clears throat> given the opportunity and a safe place, it is possible. And Dennis, you and I've witnessed it over and over men, nurturing men. It goes back to what you said, Susan, earlier, is that it is in the DNA. It is not something, it doesn't have to be created. It's not something that has to, it's, it is waiting there. Yes. It may be a dim flame, but it's there. It's, our, it's baked in. Right. And for those, if it's not there, it means you're a sociopath. Exactly. Thank you. Out of you. Then, then it, yeah, that, that then the, the, there's an actual psychological uh, right. missing, a gene missing. Right. Yeah. Mm. Huh. You know, I, I'm on my circle roll right now, Dennis. Yeah. Susan, when we get, when we gather, you know, we get 15, 18, 20 guys, and we tend to be a bit older. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a bit a, wider, a bit wider, not wiser. <laughs> wider, yeah. Wider. We're, we're, oh, we're a wider oh, shade of pale. Yeah, <laughs> not just wider. Okay, you don't have to talk about my weight <laughs> right now. I, I realize I'm working on that. I, the, you know, I've, I, right. I've gotten the COVID nineteen as I'm working on. No, but anyway, but go ahead. <laughs> All right, back to my point. We get that group of gentlemen in a circle, and add up all of our ages. Yeah, there's literally over a thousand life years of experience sitting yeah. right there, and there's something I can learn from Dennis. Dennis can learn from me, yeah. vice versa. And it, it's not necessarily the spoken word; it's sometimes it's the silence. Mm -hmm. Imagine twenty guys on a topic, and there being a pause, mm -hmm. and no one, yes. no one needing to fill that gap. That's it's where the magic is. to feel that. <clears throat> yeah. There's such, it's palpable, the energy that's there. And we go through, literally, we go through life and death together. I think it's huge what you're doing. I think it's huge what you're doing. It is so needed. I wish every man could be required. <laughs> <laughs> and we are. And, and, and the thing is, is that within these groups, there is there is the entire political spectrum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is the, the from the, from the deepest of the, the uh, from the, from left to right and all shades in between, and yeah. that's what that's what gives me hope. Yes. And it gives me hope that we're no there because we can meet at a place that is, that is beyond labels. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about labels, perfect timing. Outsmart magazine called you the mother of all mama bears yeah <laughs> can you talk about I that, love that. I, how did you feel about that what, what did you think that. i love it i mean i i i have really grown into this role of mother of you know learning through my own kid five kids that i've had that are the oldest one's 31 and a half now congratulations thank you but um but just mothering outward all the nurturing that I have found for myself, really. I didn't grow up with it. My mother died early. And um, so I had to kind of come up with my own nurturing. But now that I've really nurtured myself so much, I think, and Rob has nurtured me. He made up for all of my childhood. Mm. And, wow. Um, yeah, and we we men can bring uh, bring mothering to women, bring bring humaning to humaning, the process, right. right? And then when your cup is full, then you're able to dispense it to the world. I just feel like I'll never run out of love oh. around me. You know, mm -hmm. it's just endless in the universe. And when you all you need is your your tap open. And then it just flows through you. And I always say God is, is love looking for a place to happen. Mm. Yeah, love. God does, is not looking for the person that deserves to be loved. God is just love. And we can be loved too. 
and just dispensing it to that, that's the- I, I, I go through these phases where just like what you said about love, and I think, oh, it's like jello. I just can't grasp it. But that's the magic of, for me, in the learning about compassion. Yeah. I say it's love in action. Okay, now now it's tangible for my male brain. Yeah. Okay, and it is your actions. It, it is. Yeah. 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 And your attitude, and and Karen Armstrong is the one who, in mm-hmm. her TED talk, who I I adore. Yes. Um, she just said um, that that faith originally was defined as your actions yes. not your belief system well okay i can love somebody in action i can give my friend money to go to this thing she wants to do but she doesn't have the money or whatever and i can i can tell you god is tickled tickled with you and not at all judging you person who's been told you're being judged i can do that that's easy to do um so that's love in action. That's faith in action. It's not imparting a certain set of beliefs. Right. Well, and, and, and I know the TED Talk, mm-hmm. TED Talk. It was so inspirational to me at a very critical time in my life. Yeah. That was 2008, and then she won the TED Prize for it. Mm-hmm. And what struck me was her comment about uh, the golden rule. Yeah. All the major religious traditions. Yeah. You know, and when you were talking about the evangelical experience and so forth, I kept thinking to myself, well, what about the golden rule? Exactly. What about that? That's really the plumb line. And instead, it's just become like something we just toss aside. Mm-hmm. No. That's, that's patriarchy. Yeah. That's systems, a broken systems approach. Yeah. Uh, Susan, how do you how do you come back because you have to deal with a lot of you 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 get a lot of work and support within the community but right. then you also have to deal with especially when you're on the vanguard when you're out in, yeah. out on the edge there how how do you recharge and regain your your center your your peace of mind mm-hmm. when you've taken it taken some hits you've got at the back and you know it's at the end of the exhausting day you've had 17 speaking engagements you've done it's it's love from my family i really get charged up with love from my family just hanging out with them um with alone time i meditate i do um qigong <laughs> oh i love that yeah. The movement, the beautiful movement. And it feels so free. I feel so good in my body when I do that. And I do art. I, I've really taken up art in a big way in the past, I don't know, five years or so. And I love it. <sighs> so just things that really are for me. Yeah. And you really have to get over the guilt of taking time for yourself. I, where, Why in the world mm. do have that so deeply in our culture? But... You know, it, it's but it's necessary. If I don't keep myself going, I'm I'm no good to anybody else. You know, and the and the comments. I also know that the comments are only a projection. Mm-hmm. They're only that person expressing themselves. They're not me. They're yeah. they didn't find a beat in on me. <sighs> They're just projecting themselves. Oh, so true. You know, I would pop to mind was the old Stephen Covey, you know, sharpen your saw. Oh. You know, what was it? uh, Somebody famous once said, you know, if I have, you know, four hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend the first three sharpening my saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I've, I've never had, I've never in, in my life, Susan, I've never had a judgment that I've had about another person. And I'm talking about a judgment mm-hmm. where I'm saying something about their character, that it is not my character objectified. Mm-hmm. It is not something within me that I am holding <laughs> against myself. And the, and the, the stronger my judgment is, 
the more it's my issue. Yeah. It's extraordinary when it, when I see. So it never surprises me when I see some preacher who is preaching yeah. against so strongly against a particular behavior, a particular thing, finding that exact behavior coming in. And I go, there I am. I mean, this is so, it, it, it is so much of what we, and this is where compassion is yeah. such an extraordinary gift, because as I am compassionate for myself, I then begin to be compassionate to the world. But if I'm not, if I'm holding what I'm holding against myself, I will hold against the world. Yes. Yeah. I want to pick up on that. Yeah. And I may be projecting here, but I have a hunch that in your books, one of them, Mom, I'm gay, loving your LBG, L LGBTQ child, and strengthening your faith. The book, True Colors, Celebrating the Truth and Beauty of the Real You. Mm. God radically included the bible case for radical love and inclusion yeah and be the love you want to see in the world i bet you what you were just saying dennis is woven through yeah. each one of those books in some way can you talk about your writing yeah i mean I, so i wrote the book to parents because i knew where i had been and I know the things that get flung at them. You're just making excuses for your child. No, I'm not. I've struggled with this more than you'll ever struggle with it. I, I really, you know, so what they're facing, I, I voice that for them and talk them down from the ledge and help them understand you're okay. You're asking the right questions. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of God, you, you know, um, and the and then but while I was writing that, I knew I wanted to write True Colors, um, celebrating the truth and beauty of the real you, because mm -hmm. that community has been so maligned mm -hmm. by so many and told that God hates them. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I could and I needed to unpack that for them and help them get to the core of who they are, which is beautiful and lovely and created in God's image. And so everything I write and be the love radically included, radically included is 49 verses of why we should be radically included, inclusive instead yeah. of six verses that are twisted to say we should reject people. It's like, come on now. <laughs> yeah. All of these books and be the love you want to see in the world is all about um, how to love well, how to accept love for yourself and then how to love others well. And mm. I think that's my message till, you know, till I stop having messages um, because that's what the world needs to hear. It's what the world needs is mm. to embody love. Now, I'm going to guess that those are, that those are, you can find them on Amazon. Yes. Or on our website, we actually have all the, the PDF downloads. What? Together on the website. Okay. What is the website? Readhearts.org. Freed, freedhearts.org. Yeah, so freedhearts. There's an S. Freed hearts. Freedhearts. Yeah. Dot org. Okay. So how on on the exiting the pandemic, as we begin to get this, very seldom in human history have we had a chance to re-come out and redo our opportunities yeah. This is this is one. This yeah. is one of those chances. Can we? How can we come out of this with the lessons we've learned and come out of this and do things in a new way? So, what's what's in your windshield? What are you thinking about? What's what's on your heart and on in your mind? Yeah, I I think that um, we we should come out of this humble knowing that if we're not one of the half a million people who died from COVID. Then just we, in the U.S. Just in the U.S., yes. Then we can be grateful and come out with some humility to say, you know, our systems are really full of holes. You know, they're more like a, 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 a screen that are letting so many people fall through. We need to find those stories. We need to privilege those stories 
and speak up for the people who need to be helped. That's what that's what I hope our attitude is coming out. If we just double down on getting things back to normal, what that means is back to oppression. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's what we don't want to do. Yes. Dennis, you said, I think you said, restart. I submit that it's not restart, that it's new start. Beautiful. Hmm. Yeah. And that's why we wanted to talk with you, Susan, because we need we need your voice. <clears throat> what, what we're seeing around the world, I mean, Chile got together and they're writing a new constitution. This is, you know, where when we're talking about where democracy and they're talking about how autocracy versus democracy and in Chile, eight, over 80 percent voted to say that they want a new constitution and that, that no politician can be involved in making the new constitution, wow. the one that is in office. And not only that, they are also saying that that women must be included at 50% level in all of the processes and offices and the writing of what, wow. what they're doing. They did this in an entire country of what's wow. going in South America. And so they're, they're, women are standing up around the world in so many powerful ways and thank god you are thank god thank god we otherwise we're just hobbled we're otherwise we're from the neck up we cannot make what we need to happen in the world without women who know how to access their compassion and to help men access their compassion that's exactly right yeah, yeah. what a gift i hope i hope in this country that we make some changes on our elections Yes. We work it so the gerrymandering doesn't happen anymore. Mm-hmm. So we fix the electoral college, which I know I'm out of my league now because I'm not a political science person. But you can you can fix it so the electoral. You're a citizen. I am a citizen. You're a citizen, and you have your voice, yes. and your voice is what we're doing. That's what why we needed you yes. here, Clay. You were going to say something, and I cut you off. You did, and I forgot. Yeah, I had a feeling. I wanted to do that, Susan. I did that. On I'm not going to say what I, it was. I, I, know, I, I did that on purpose because I can see Clay. Those of us that are watching the podcast, as I can know, I know Clay well enough to know that that he had something to say, and I knew that it it would just he completely <laughs> forgot it. And so I just thank you, thank you for letting me do that. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, I, it, it is such a blessing. It is such a blessing to know that the work that you're doing on the planet, Susan, I'm so grateful that women are allowing us to be able to come back and to grow and to be open. That that mothering, that nurturing that allows us to be able to stand up and to be the men who we can be. This future mm-hmm this future that is going to be beyond the limit of my ability to imagine it yeah. is stronger, but I'm going in that direction through yeah. working with you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. We have a vested interest. You know, you're half the planet. <laughs> Most of us are in front of you. So yeah, we-, <laughs> <laughs> we want it to work. Yeah. Out. I, I love the idea of enlightened self-interest yeah. is that I can get the best for me by bringing out the best in you. Yeah. yeah. And shouldn't we all be that way? I mean, it all, it's symbiotic. It should totally be that way. I love it. Ah, oh, well, I'm great. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming with us today on this journey. Thank you for coming with us and sharing this beautiful aspect of what you're doing, uh, Susan, and how you're doing, and 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 your 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 beautiful family that you're bringing in, and the work that you're doing. And Clay, you are inviting me, and 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 I want to tell just for for for. Um, historical and connection is that while this was where i had heard of clay for quite a while before i met him but it was at that particular place where you two met was where i met clay and that that was at the at the at the the, university right at uh huston 
uh -huh. uh, yeah it was it was there and that was where i met clay so i was adjacent to loving you <laughs> at the moment when i was doing that so i've now come up i i feel i feel so so absolutely closing of a circle to be able to meet you susan you. and an honor and yeah. do that it was such a pleasure thank clay thank you do you have anything to close out this this wonderful time I want to continue this conversation. And we will in the after party. I encourage everyone to stick around for the after party and and thank everyone. Thank everyone for joining and being part of this podcast, this journey in search of the new compassionate male. I will expect my email. I have something I want to talk with you about okay. just to be able to say hello. What, where are you in the world at the moment? Uh, Seattle. I saw this beautiful, beautiful uh -huh. electric trolley that, uh, that, that, that went by. And can we see uh, Mount Rainier out your, probably yeah. not today, but. <laughs> that, it's that way. So yeah, it's that, it's that, but anyway, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> That's awesome. So do you live in Washington? Yes, we live in Seattle. We moved in there uh, actually just after the New Story Fest festival. Okay. Yeah, because our kids moved here, and so uh, we're going to be near them. So anyway. yeah, men, men teaching men that is so vital. I was I was thinking when you were talking about that that you're right. Men can get very close to their wives. Often they'll share with their wives, but that's it. Well. And still, and still, now, I, I'm not going to speak about every man, but there's still a level that I, I know that I can't yeah. get and to. Things you can't talk. They won't go to the doctor usually. They, you know, mm -hmm. you can't tell them a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just typical of masculinity. Of, uh -huh. of it. Yeah, no, that's just like. You know, getting lost on the highway. Are we going to turn around? Right. No. Prove our point. We're <laughs> what point are you proving exactly? Right. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you this. Was there anything that, uh, I mean, we wandered everywhere on, on the conversation. It was wonderful. I love the energy of it. Was there anything that we overlooked one thing that that bothers me a lot is that schools continue to tolerate bullying that a kid can go to school every single day they can count on the same bullies harassing them even beating them up every day okay it happens once okay we didn't see that coming but it continues why is nobody in there saying we're not doing this. This is not what school is for. Why is that not happening? It's all part of the patriarchy that we don't even stop things that we know, let alone school shootings, you know. Mm. We we wonder why that happens, but bullying happens every single day in school and nobody does anything about it. That's just and there are programs, there are anti bullying things, but you know, it needs to be every school needs to have leadership and what should be the primary thing is keep kids safe well they you know the political whatever the capital of chile that's okay but the first thing is don't get beaten up don't get threatened and harassed every day and that goes well beyond school yeah i i have i'm not going to go into the story but being bullied in the work environment in the corporate environment mm -hmm. it's it it can be it's um, toxic and it's rampant yep yes so, yeah you could start there you know and of course the church bullies all the time by saying who's not okay who got mm -hmm. who us? all of that is bullying you know you have to fit this mold so sure yeah, yeah. well thank you so much
Well, I'm sorry, I couldn't come up with anything else that we haven't talked about, but I thought we did a good job. <laughs> oh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I had fun, and, and I almost cried a couple of times. So, but it's wonderful uh, to get your little, you know, your little your newsletter, or whatever. And I'm like, I'll listen occasionally to the speaker, or whatever, and it's like, oh man, that's really good. Yeah, it's such wonderful people from all over the world. Yeah, and there is a common tone to it. Yes, that the golden rule yeah. and compassion, yes. and the other thing that I really truly believe that there's so many things pointing to this moment in time uh -huh. is truly pivotal for civilization. Mm -hmm. I do too. You know, I, I I just really became conscious of this few months ago that you know copernicus stood up 500 years ago on the table and he said hey guys we got this wrong mm -hmm. you know the earth rotates around the sun not the other way yes that was a fundamental everything went back to zero yes, yes. but that also started out the myth of progress where you can prove it by science and the in science and spirituality began to split yeah yes and this because, well, hmm? Because spirituality couldn't bend at all. But before, my perception was that that they could that they could run side by side. That science would say, "Well, you know, we can't figure it out. There's something bigger going on. That's okay." Right. But once we figured out that we could decide that the Earth went around the Sun, then no, you have to prove it by scientific fact, or it doesn't exist. Uh, yes, yes. And I think to add to that, we also know that the church wouldn't accept science because they didn't kowtow to the church. The, the right. Or didn't want to give up that power. So, yeah. All those elements probably. Mm -hmm. Well, and I've just this last year begun to scratch just the surface of astrology. I, I've gotten to know. Uh, Richard Tarnas, mm -hmm. who's one of the foremost astrologers in the in the U.S., his book Pas "The Passions of the Western Mind" mm -hmm. is required reading in over a hundred universities. Wow! And he's been on the show, and in his books, that book "Passions of the Western Mind" and the other one, "Cosmos and Psyche," you know, they talk about the planetary alignment and what has just been occurring and occurred you know this last year points to fundamental change it points wow. to really a new start happening and i equate it to copernicus story yeah. it's i believe it's that big it's happening now it's not something that's going to happen we right now today are in the midst of it and it's, it's all all that it really does. Say, say that again it gives me so much hope to hear oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's funny you mentioned that because i was before you said copernicus i was thinking that i had just read the dancing wooly masters hmm. by zukov by who <laughs> gary zukov he wrote the oh, yeah, yeah. And, and i read it back in college and i thought oh i'm gonna read that again now and it talks about how we discovered with quarks and quantum physics that we don't know that that what how we observe something determines what it is. Right. It just is in it's crazy, mind boggling. And mm -hmm. it, all these things are as powerful as Copernicus and Newton and their life changing things that they said. Right. But I'm gonna find that Richard Tarnas. I'm gonna find those books. Oh gosh. They're right they're they're right there. <laughs> I have been in in Cosmos and Psyche. I have been on the first fifty pages for the past three months. One of those, okay. <laughs> and it's not because it's hard to read; it's because it's so beautifully written and so energized with. I just savor going back and reading it and absorbing and going. This really, yeah, yeah. And uh, he, matter of fact, he's going to be back on the show in May. 
Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So I can listen to the other one too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Susan. It's going to be probably next week when I get this. Um, sure.